Hi everybody, I'm Alex Converse, and I'm going to be talking about wavelet codecs today. Uh, wavelet codecs were sort of the uh, new future of video coding technology somewhere around 2000. And 15 years later, we're still not really using wavelet codecs. Instead, we're using like extensions of the old DCT codecs that were originally developed in the 80s. And I'm going to try to explain why that is. Uh, this slide was also chosen because uh, the movie Back to the Future takes place in 1985 and in uh, the sequel they go ahead to 2015 and we're going to be uh, flopping back and forth between the 80s and the present day. So the, the clearly obvious reason that no one uses wavelet codecs is that the Illuminati have killed the wavelet codec just like they killed the electric car and the LED light bulb and all of those other wonderful technologies that don't exist. I probably also should note at this point that I work on a DCT codec uh, for my job, so I may be a little bit biased, so you might want to take everything I say with a grain of salt. And also, everything in these slides are my opinions, not my employer Google's opinions. So uh, the history of DCT codecs. In 1985, you have our opening slide. In 1986, uh, the JPEG committee forms, and uh, they're trying to put together a still image codec. Uh, two years later, in 1988, uh, the MPEG committee forms to put together a video codec. Uh, MPEG winds up using a lot of the same similar techniques from JPEG. Uh, MPEG-1 is finalized in 1992, the year after JPEG. And then they just kind of kept iterating on that design uh, up to 2013, where HEVC came out. Explain the future events. <laughs> No, All right. <laughs> so uh, the basic way JPEG and DCT image codec works, works is they uh, divide the image up into a set of blocks. You take the DCT transform of each block. The DCT transform basically, uh, instead of uh, looking at the pixel value of each block, you represent the block as a weighted sum of uh, these sort of DCT basis functions. There's a, a nice mathy way to figure out what that proper weighted sum is. But just conceptually, uh, it's a weighted sum of these. Uh, if you have an 8x8 eight eight block, you have an 8x8 eight eight set of uh, DCT coefficients. So once you've taken the uh, DCT of each block, you're going to quantize the coefficients, which is basically a fancy word for rounding. Uh, rounding them down to multiples of uh, big numbers so that you can say that uh, rather than I have a value of 21, I have 3 for 3 sevens. Uh, so then you're going to uh, tokenize it, which basically means you have this, you have uh, DCT coefficients for each of these bins, and you need to come up with a way to say, like, I have uh, a DC value, and then I have three AC values, and then I have end of block. So that sort of includes uh, coming up with the scan order and then saying, here's my DCT values, and here are uh, here's my DCT values, and here's the order that I have them laid out in, and uh, sort of put these into a library of symbols that you're going to feed to a lossless compressor, which is entropy coding. And then you're done. You have a JPEG. Question? Uh, more, more like a statement. One of the things that really helped me understand this process was, if you look up in the top left, like a solid color or like a nice gradient, those things happen a lot. But down in the bottom right, like a crisscross pattern at every single pixel, that doesn't happen a lot. And that's kind of why this thing works as well, as, as part of the uh, uh, tokenizing and entropy coding. It, we focus on the top left uh, at the expense of making the bottom right more expensive. But the bottom right doesn't really happen that much, so we can throw it away more. Yeah, the, uh, someone just weighed in and said that these top left patterns tend to happen more often, and also when they happen in combination with other patterns, they're what's visually dominant in the image. So these ones are cheaper to code if you start zigzagging from the top left, and the ones at the bottom right are more expensive, but the expensive ones happen less. All right, so to go from an image codec to a video codec, uh, in a video codec, generally, the best prediction of your uh, current frame is the previous frame. So we've already chopped up the image into blocks, so we'll just kind of shuffle those blocks around a bit. Uh, motion prediction, basically. So the idea is that you can say, I'm using the value in the previous frame at this position, or I'm using, 
the uh, value from somewhere nearby, and I'm going to encode the distance. And then on top of that, you can put an error if there's some sort of additional change on top of that. And if it's completely unrepresentable, then you can just go back to coding a pure DCT block. So this is the approach we've been using pretty much forever, and how well is it working out? So is there like a way to figure out what the, uh, what the theoretical limit is? Well, we know uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> And the average English speaker has a vocabulary, native speaker has a vocabulary from between 20,000 and 35,000 words. So uh, log base two of 30,000 to the 1,000 <laughs> says that you should be able to encode an image in 14.87 uh, kilobits, any image, I guess. <laughs> but even worse, in 1959, this guy, Dennis Gabor, Nobel Prize winner, writes in IEEE Transactions on Information Theory, which is like the, the big journal on compression. He says, uh, 20 bits per second is what the experts tell us the human eye is capable of taking in at a time. And I don't know what settings you guys are using on your codex, but I don't think any of you are running at 20 BPS. <laughs> and if you try to uh, lower the data rate, on a DCT codec. This is sort of the failure mode on the left that you're gonna see. You're gonna see a ton of blocking and a ton of banding. So we have to try something completely different if we're gonna try to get to this 20 bits per second. So uh, a bunch of fresh French mathematicians uh, published a bunch of papers on something called undlets or wavelets. And they, they started this work back in 1982, right around the same time that the, the DCT codec work was starting to come out. And uh, they started with a continuous transform first, and then a year later they had a discrete transform, which was pretty good considering how long it took to get from the uh, Fourier transform to the FFT, except if you forget that Gauss invented the FFT like a billion years ago and everybody forgot about it. But then uh, they did a bunch of uh, improvements. Uh, Ingrid Dabachez came along and really sort of made wavelets useful uh, with coming up with ways to make them bleed between bands and between neighboring coefficients less, and then lifting schemes, which make them way less computationally uh, uh, intensive to calculate. And uh, sort of right after that work was done, JPEG issues a call for proposals for their new standard. They have that DCT codec that we just looked at, and they want to do something better. So uh, they wind up developing a wavelet codec that they released in 2000 called JPEG 2000, of course. And uh, it's just an image codec. And uh, the BBC released a video codec called Dirac in 2008, uh, which got standardized by SMPTE as VC2. Uh, and that's a wavelet codec with full motion. Oops, sorry. Uh, so, what is a wavelet if it's not an omelet? <laughs> in uh, 1985, I might use the dictionary definition, but since it's 2015, I'm going to use the Wikipedia. <laughs> but first, a uh, personal appeal from Jimmy Wales. <laughs> so a wavelet is a wave-like oscillation with an amplitude that begins at zero, increases, and then decreases back to zero, yada, yada, yada. In formal terms, this representation is a wavelet series representation of a square integrable function with respect to a complete orthonormal set of basis functions or an overcomplete set of frame vector space for the Hilbert space of square integrable functions. Of course. <laughs> I have an question. Yes? Is that a Chrome extension that adds the personal appeal thing on every Wikipedia page? No, I just <laughs> manually stuck it in in Dom Inspector. Okay. So the first sentence that I read there actually was useful. Uh, a wavelet starts at zero, has some sort of oscillation, and goes back to zero, as opposed to a sine wave, which just keeps waving on forever and ever and ever. So the idea is that a, with a wavelet, you can localize something in both time and frequency. Uh, if you were around when I did my uh, presentation on AAC, I talked about how if you have a, uh, a chirp, like if you start something at 500 hertz, and go up to five kilohertz, and you just take the FFT of that mess, you'll see all of the frequencies between 500 hertz and five kilohertz all at the same time. 
And the idea is wavelets are supposed to give you a framework where you can sort of trade off between time and frequency. Oops. So you're going to use that wavelet function that was right here as a digital filter. And you're just going to kind of keep shifting and computing uh, your digital filtering convolution sum, which is just sort of saying, how much does this look like my filter? And then you're going to scale what you had before and do it again, and that's how you're going to get your different uh, frequencies. So the idea is that, the, is that this wave shape is going to be excited by certain frequencies in your signal, and then as you resize it, it'll be excited by new frequencies, and the, uh, the spatial location in the signal is re the result of sliding it along the signal. And once you've done that once, you can uh, repeat it over and over and over again, depending on uh, how many different frequency bins you need. So uh, let's try this on some sort of real function. This is just a step. It's, a, it's zero until zero, and then it jumps to one. So uh, we run this wavelet on top of it once, and uh, for our high frequencies, we get this excitation right at zero, and for our low frequencies, it's spread out a little bit. And uh, that kind of makes sense conceptually because the only thing of interest in this, uh, in this step is the edge. So the wavelet should hopefully only respond to the edge. And it makes sense that it spreads out because whenever you convert something between time and frequency, if it's really narrow in time or really narrow in frequency, it winds up more spread out in the other domain. So once we've done this once, we can do it again and again. And uh, the idea is that uh, as you get further away from the, uh, the step, the more you're going to see more of your low frequencies appear. And these new wavelet bands uh, basically are re-subdividing uh, whatever is your leftover coefficients into a new high frequency and low frequency band. So uh, this actually makes a lot more sense when I do it on an image. But first, I just wanted to say that uh, wavelets, the way they keep subdividing, uh, your super high frequencies wind up not very localized in frequency, but very localized in time. And as you get to lower and lower frequencies, you wind up more localized in frequency and less localized in time. And that kind of makes sense, because if you say something is oscillating at a very slow frequency, to actually prove that it's oscillating and that you're not just pattern matching it to whatever you think, you need more uh, samples to get a full cycle. Uh, an alternative approach is the uh, short time Fourier transform, where you just uh, divide your, your uh, input up into segments yourself and take the Fourier transform of each segment. So applying this wavelet transform to an image, and I'm applying it in both directions here, uh, what you have in the top left, these are what's called the approximation coefficients, and they basically look like a downscaled version of the original image. And then uh, below and to the right, you have your horizontal and vertical detail coefficients, and these correspond to the sharp edges of uh, the things that were approximated, and also to sort of some background noise. So the idea here is that you could recombine this by upscaling it and by upscaling this pattern and adding them together. And this sort of has your low frequencies, and this has all of the super sharp detail. So right away, you can kind of see that this would be useful for compression because you could say, take this image up here and then take uh, the most important detail, you could say you're going to run an edge detect, which is super old solved problem in image processing, and encode the edges in way, in a tiny fraction of these pixels here, and you've essentially cut your data rate by uh, three quarters. And also, within this image, everything is perfectly, uh, spatial relationships are uh, preserved. I mean, his eyes are above his mouth, and, uh, you know, the clock tower is still on the right. And down here, 
the uh, details are, have the same correlation with each other, and then they have the uh, correlation above where uh, you know, the edge of his face is here, and the edge of his face you just translate down. It's the same position if you weren't going to mosaic these, which is kind of a neat property. And then you can say, all right, that's pretty cool. Let's do it again. It's a little bit harder on the projector now to see the details, but the same sort of pattern has emerged where you have the low resolution image and then your details. And then you can do that again, and I could keep doing this, but we're sort of running out of space on this slide. So instead, this is the, uh, the DCT of the whole image. I know image codecs normally do the DCT of a block, but uh, you know, I said before that his eyes were above his mouth in uh, the wavelet transform. Uh, are his eyes above his mouth in this image? Yeah, like, no one can tell. It's, there's no spatial correlation at all. So why are, why are wavelets appealing? You have a resistance to blocking artifacts because uh, you can keep preserving your low frequencies, which are just going to blur instead of block as you blow them back up. They're scale independent, which can create all sorts of cool, I want to decode at half resolution, uh, type applications, or uh, progressive decode, or that sort of thing. So JPEG 2000 was sort of the first mainstream, not research project, wavelet image codec. And the way it works is you take your image, you do this preprocessing component, which I'll come back to, and then you take the uh, discrete wavelet transform, which was the uh, transform that I just did to Marty McFly, and then you quantize those transform coefficients, and then you do a, a binary arithmetic coder, kind of like Kaibeck in H.264, and then you're going to reorganize your components to make sure that you have all of your stuff from those uh, top left low frequencies together so that you can get at that first because that's the most important part of the image. And then you uh, basically spit that out. Unfortunately, the pre-processing step is basically tiling the image. So you still do have blocks. They're just much bigger than JPEG blocks. I'm not 100% sure why they added the tiling, but I'm pretty sure it was for hardware constraints. Because the DCT is n log n, uh, and you sort of need to put the, keep the whole thing in memory, but the wavelet can just be expressed, expressed as a digital filter, so you don't need to have your whole input in memory while you're working on it. So then, we have our still image, so what happens when we add motion? Well, uh, when we normally shuffle the blocks around, uh, we're going to get blocking artifacts at the block boundaries, but the DCT, it has its maxima at the edges. The problem is that now we're injecting these sharp edges in the wavelet transform, and we saw what happened when we transformed uh, the step function before, how it kind of spread out. So we don't want new edges to spread out, so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to overlap a series of blocks. So every pixel in your... Uh, P-frame can come from up to four blocks weighted average from your uh, references. So if you're right in the middle, you only really need one reference, but if you're down here in a corner to prevent blocks, you really need multiple references. And this is called uh, overlapped block motion compensation, or OBMC. So these are sort of the notable wavelet codecs, in my opinion. Uh, there's JPEG 2000, Motion JPEG 2000. Despite the motion in the name, that just means a series of JPEG 2000 images. Uh, this actually has a bit of use in medical imaging, where you have very, very high resolution images, and you want to be able to pan in and out quickly, which kind of makes sense with the scalability property. And also for digital cinema, where you have very high resolutions, and you don't need a lot of compression. Basically, you're transporting these things around on a truck, and you just need to make sure you're not saturating the hard drive you're reading from for 8K video, which isn't as trivial as it sounds, but uh, JPEG 2000 does this well. Probably the next most important wavelet codec is uh, Dirac v slash VC2, which is from the BBC. It adds motion. It has B frames and, all and P frames and things like that. It uses the uh, motion compensation scheme I just described. BBC uses it internally for a bunch of events, 
but as far as I know, they don't use it externally, and they've kind of stopped developing it further. So for a scalable video, when MPEG issued their call for proposals, there were uh, 14 proposals submitted. 12 of them were wavelet-based, which makes sense for scalable coding, because you can immediately say, I'm just going to throw out the top most layer, and that's going to be my lower resolution layer in my scalable codec. A scalable codec, if you're not familiar with the concept, is something that can, you can throw away bits on the fly without re-encoding your sequence to uh, deal with bandwidth constraints and things like that and still be compatible. And you can gracefully add new layers when you get bandwidth back. So wavelets seem like, like a shoe in for this. And 12 proposals were wavelets, and instead they picked one of the two H.264 base proposals. <laughs> so uh, the red camera company has their own wavelet codec. I don't really know how, much, how well it works. It's proprietary to their platform. I don't know for a first engineer version of it. So uh, I think it kind of operates at high bit rates, but I can't really speak to it well. FFmpeg had a uh, native wavelet codec called Snow, which tries to mix some of the uh, uh, Motion JPEG 2000 and OBMC concepts with uh, some H.264 infrastructure that they already had in FFmpeg. And like, it was kind of interesting as a research project, and no, but no one really used it. And then uh, after the fork, uh, a lot of energy went into trying to keep up with both sides of the fork, and people kind of lost interest in this. Ziff had this uh, video codec called Tarkin before Theora. It was kind of experimental, and they didn't really finish the first experiment. <laughs> and uh, MPEG-4 also has this texture codec, because they had kind of envisioned MPEG-4 to have like flash-like interactivity, and you could like do chroma key on the fly in your MP4 file and stuff like that, and you could use uh, this wavelet image codec of four textures for that purpose, which was completely insane from like a system design perspective, so nobody wanted to use this. So why uh, didn't wavelet codecs take off? Well, they kind of suck at intraprediction. They also suck at dealing with the interface between intraprediction and in interprediction and intraprediction, between predicting from the previous frame and mixing that with new content. And H.264 was wildly, wildly successful. So uh, Dark Shakiri says that there isn't a uh, known method for uh, efficient intracoding in wavelet codecs. H.264's spatial prediction is extraordinarily powerful, but relies on fully decoded exact pixels from the uh, top and left of the current block. And he says that uh, H.264's intraprediction is super powerful, but what HGVC has, if you've looked at that, like completely puts the H.264 uh, solution to shame. It's just an order of magnitude more powerful. So uh, what he kind of means by this is uh, you go through your macro blocks in kind of uh, line order. And when you get to the current block, you have fully decoded pixels uh, minus the loop filter for all the way above you and all the way to your left down to the bottom of your current macro block. And you can apply a pattern and say, generate, fill this block based on my pattern, and then I'm going to encode the difference between the pattern that I've specified and what the image actually is. And the patterns H.264 allows for are all of these. There's down vertical, there's across horizontal, there's DC, which is just the average, and then there's a bunch of directional predictors. And what HGVC adds is a crap ton more directional predictors. So uh, here is an image that I am going to intra-predict. And I'm just going to do this in VP9 because I had the tooling for VP9 around. I would have rather done this in H.264, but I didn't have H.264 tools installed. So uh, here's the predicted values of this image. And it looks a lot like that image. And that's just specifying on each block uh, what size partition we're using and which one of those prediction schemes we want to use. And here it's basically saying what each of those prediction schemes is, but I'm going to remove the overlay so that you can see it a little bit better. And in the top left, there's no neighbors, so you can't predict well at all. And uh, as you move away from that, like here in the uh, tree bark, you can get a lot of texture just from the predictor. 
and across the tree branch, the same thing, and on the side of the bird's face, the same thing. So then you have this mess left over, and you have a lot of sharp edges, and I just said you don't want to have to encode sharp edges. But the brilliant thing about these sharp edges is they're already on your transform block boundaries. So you're not really encoding the edge. Instead, this is just how you're chopping up the image. So then you can put it back together, and it looks pretty much, uh, once you've put it through the projector, identical to what we put in. So uh, inter and intra prediction. So uh, Pengvado, who's another X264 developer, says uh, that the transition between inter and intra blocks is worse because if you have motion, you can smooth a bunch of blocks together and uh, you might have imperfect prediction, but at least you're not uh, putting in some sort of transition you're going to have to get rid of. But smoothing between inter and intra just gets really weird because you start encoding a bunch of detail and then you smooth that right out again. It's introducing sharp edges. Uh, and in general, you want to be able to use some number of intra blocks uh, self-contained on an inter frame, which is f uh, blocks from the previous frame again, because if you just have two blocks of video, uh, the difference between two similar blocks is going to be very small, but it's much harder to code the difference between two completely mismatched blocks than between just painting it blank with the DCT, which or with the DC rather, which was uh, you know these big flat patches here, than uh, to basically try to uncode your old block and then code your new block all at once. So uh, here's the frame we were looking at. And here's the next frame in the sequence. And here is the predicted frame in VP9. So you have basically all of the stuff where you see the super sharp detail is predicted from the previous frame, generally with no motion here because the background isn't moving. And all of the new stuff is either using big uh, DC prediction, average prediction, or uh, smaller directional prediction. And your error signal is very small. For a big chunk of the frame, it's almost nothing. Uh, for where there was no good predictor, you have stuff that looked like what we saw in the keyframe. And here's how it's actually coded. Uh, where you see the uh, yellow skip, which is kind of hard to make out on this projector, that means that no, no transform coefficients are coded at all. So you're only coding Im information for part of the image. And looking at it here, where you're updating the tree, this is all sort of very smooth, easy to code, uh, nice, mellow, low frequencies. So you put it back together, and you have that. So we're going to do this again with Dirac. Now, I don't really want you to see this as a codec shootout. I kind of broke Dirac to turn off B frames, because uh, looking at where predictors are coming from from two frames is more complicated, and their rate control is really tuned to uh, uh, intra only or to uh, with B frames. And also, uh, I don't necessarily know what the ideal settings are. This is more conceptual than anything. So here we are again getting smacked in the face, and here's the predicted frame. And it kind of does a really lousy job where there isn't anything in the uh, previous image to predict from. Uh, sometimes it just completely blurs it out, which is okay. But on this interface here, you kind of have a mess, and kind of have a mess over here on the tree and down with what's changing in the foot. It, basically, all it can do is try to blur out what was already there because it can't do intra blocks. And then this is the error it's coding, which maybe doesn't look that much uh, smaller in number of pixels included, but it has uh, much sharper details. And in uh, the uh, DCT codec example, the details were aligned along bo block boundaries, and here they're not. So you have to do this really sharp transition here, which is going to use super high frequency coefficients, which are going to be expensive to encode. So the result here doesn't look that great, even on the projector uh, of it put back together. Both of these were targeting the same bit rate. And here's what we were supposed to have instead again. So uh, Dirk Shakiri also pointed out some other issues. 
Uh, I'm not going to read this whole slide, but basically if you go back to the uh, overlapped blo motion blocks, uh, if you have different sizes, the ideal amount of overlap is different, and that's very hard to figure out. And ultimately, all of the wavelet codec codecs like, uh, that have motion, like Dirac and Snow, basically punt on that decision and say, the amount of overlap is always exactly the same. So it, it's one problem to be solved that no one has bothered to solve. Uh, in X264, they're really big on uh, spatial adaptive quantization, where you basically say, I'm going to use more bits on uh, spatially more interesting uh, and especially dark parts of the image. And uh, in X264, with uh, spatial quantization on, you see huge gains compared to uh, optimizing for PSNR. In Theora, when they finally got to be not super crappy and just to be uh, when they went from not being behind XVID and just went to being behind X264, that spatial adaptive quantization was what they added. And uh, spatial adaptive quantization is usually added as an encoder gets mature because you're pulling bits away from your uh, metrics optimal solutions into uh, human psychovisual areas. And as a result of that, uh, whenever anyone else tries to add an optimization, they say, oh, look, uh, I've just increased uh, our encoder performance by 0.5 dB. But what they've really done is just broken spatial adaptive quantization. <laughs> and uh, Dirac does support spatial adaptive quantization, though uh, the first Dirac encoder didn't use it. I don't know if the second one did. JPEG 2000 has a region of interest tool, which isn't the same thing, but it's conceptually similar and could solve similar problems. And uh, the other wavelet codecs I mentioned were sort of more of these research projects. They never really got anywhere close to needing uh, spatial quantization. And the last thing uh, is that Dark Shakiri claims that wavelets don't code visually, visual energy effectively. And what this is, if you've ever tried to read uh, the X264 blog post, post, and they're constantly talking about visual energy, basically they're talking about uh, the energy of all of the coefficients except this top one up here. So the idea is here I have a patch of grass from a video clip and I've taken the, uh, the black and white channel and down here I just have the, the top left coefficient and here I have a set of coefficients that were randomly generated that have the same sum squared values as uh, the original. And the error here, uh, sum squared error for the uh, flat is 893. And for uh, uh, the random coefficients, it's uh, more than twice as much, or maybe about twice as much. And the idea is that even though our error is twice as big on this side, visually, neither of them are a good match. But this one is going to be a lot more disturbing when you're seeing random flat patches of your image. Uh, and uh, because uh, you uh, start quantizing, if you have multiple levels of wavelet decomposition, as you start uh, zeroing out those high frequency coefficients, you start to generate big flat patches. So uh, X264, or H264 rather, was wildly successful. They both were successful, but uh, I know it kind of seems now like, duh, of course it was successful, but H.263 and MPEG-4 Part 2, no one really wanted to use those codecs except for pirates, which means nobody got paid. Um, so uh, why was H.264 successful? It was uh, a unified standard between uh, MPEG and ITU, as opposed to, uh, for H.263, ITU kind of put together this kit codec where they said, here are the basics, and here's a bunch of features you can optionally add, uh, go to town, mix and match, make your own configuration, which works really well for getting different implementations to talk to each other. And MPEG's, uh, MPEG 4 Part 2 is sort of one set of those tools. Uh, they took the worst features from MPEG 4 Part 2 and H.263, like uh, Global Motion and QPEL, and they simplified the uh, QPEL, which is quarter pixel uh, estimation. Uh, they went from an eight coefficient filter to six, which is uh, a quarter easier to compute. And for global motion, they just completely got rid of that. They said, no encoder has time to try to uh, 
figure out global matches on top of uh, sort of based from zero. And instead they used uh, the concept of uh, your motion field where you can say the simple cases of global motion are already handled by saying, just use the motion vector from my neighbor. So H.264 uh, has relatively cheap licensing, uh, cheaper than MP3, which just does audio and it's like a billion years old. There's only one patent pool, although there's a couple other people, compared to what just happened with HEVC with two patent pools. Um, H.264 hardware is, Matt? Would you mind, the two patent pool thing? I hadn't, hadn't heard this. Would you mind giving? Uh, a second patent pool called uh, HEVC Advanced uh, was just announced earlier this week. It has a couple big name licensors that weren't in the MPEG LA group. Oops, sweet. You know, it doesn't have a patent pool on it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> H.264 has hardware, everywhere. H.264, they added this loop filter to combat blocking, right? One of the big things about wavelets is they didn't have blocking, but it's not like DCT Codex just said, oh, well, we have to live with blocks forever and gave up on them. They continue to come up with ways to fight blocking. So H.264, once you finish decoding your frame, you basically say, here's all my block boundary edges. I'm going to kind of fuzz them over, and I'm going to use this image as my predictor for the next frame. H.264 grew up in the age of open source. Uh, X.264 is probably the most famous implementation, but uh, there were a whole bunch of competing open source implementations right as the standard was being developed, and it allowed sort of people just to, uh, people screwing around with video streaming just to basically grab an open source H.264 implementation and set it up without talking to, without getting a licensing agreement from some big encoder provider. And H.264, it just, it just kind of smells nice. H.264 is always there for you. You can work all day long trying to replace H.264 and go home and put on Netflix and H.264 doesn't care that you were just trying to murder it. <laughs> but, uh, question? I think one of the things that's like skimmed over a lot is like X264 is really fast as well. It is really fast. Like you can do it in real time, mm -hmm. which was also kind of cool. Yeah, forgetting patents, and X264 is like the best video coder available. And forgetting patents is free and open source. Yeah. There's a lot of forgetting going on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a. But a lot of a lot of the X264 optimizations, there, there's a certain framework to sort of allow it to be fast. But just a whole ton of SIMD was drive-by stuff from people adapting stuff from other open source codecs and things like that that allowed it to get really fast. Uh, within sort of the, H, the X264 uh, licensing company, if you want to ship it in your product and not buy a GPL version, there's a whole ton of people who just did like assembly for VP8 and for stuff like that who adapted that to X264 and uh, I uh, helped make X264 faster that way. But uh, the MPEG convener always likes to say, this is not a place to discuss matters such as data partitions in H.264, because he gets upset that people don't call it AVC. So uh, like I said, the DCT codecs haven't really been asleep, and they've added a bunch of things to uh, be able to try to compete with some of these things that wavelets have. Wavelets are really resistant to blocking, and in uh, H.264, they have this loop filter. And in HEVC and VP9, you have this uh, single-sided transform, where the idea is if you have strong prediction coming in from this side, and remember, this is an error we're encoding. It's not a pure signal. Your error right near where you're coming in is probably going to be its lowest. And it's probably going to propagate across the image if you have a strong directional pred predictor. So they added a transform that does just that. And if you're coming in from this side, you're not going to get a blocking artifact because basically no energy is encoded on this side, so there's no difference, there's no blockage. Uh, HEVC and VP9 also have a number of multi-scale uh, features. They have variable prediction size going from like 64 by 64 down to sub 8 by 8. There's variable transform size. Uh, adapting between 4 by 4 transform and 32 by 32 transform uh, you know, 
I don't think you can say you're doing that and your codec isn't multi-resolution. It's not necessarily resolution independent, but it definitely has multi-scale processing features that way. And VP9 also allows if uh, what happens in your video starts going completely crazy out of control, you can dynamically downscale for a period of time and then upscale uh, and you can scale your reference buffers without having to throw a keyframe or anything like that. And as far as our friend Dennis Gabor, who said uh, 20 bits per second, well, David Foster Wallace said, <laughs> Dennis Gabor may very well have been the Antichrist. <laughs> so basically, my take on this is that uh, the wavelet codecs are the ones that belong in the 80s. The research on wavelets happened at the same time DCT codecs were being developed. DCT codecs continued to be developed. Uh, H.264's wild success definitely sucked some of the energy out of the wavelet uh, codec uh, investment. BBC said that they were going to invest less in DIRAC because H.264 is so cheap and so good. Um, so, and uh, they've also in many ways aren't pure DCT. H.264 has its wild integer, not wild, it has its DCT approximate uh, integer transform. HEVC has the uh, single-sided transform, which isn't a DCT at all, it's a sine transform. So, you know, if you work really hard and compromise everything about your identity and have billions of dollars invested in you, maybe things will work out all right for you. <laughs> all right, question? Uh, I'm really not a codec expert at all, but uh, the scuttlebutt that I've been hearing uh, lately is that spatial prediction is, is a dead end, and that uh, people are, are going to uh, prediction in the frequency domain. Uh, there's, there's a zip codec called uh, DALA that's all based on predicting uh, frequency uh, coefficients. I don't know. Have you, have you any thoughts on as great as X264 is, what you would look for for the next generation besides weight loss? All right, so that's a good question. I'm going to rewind a second back to the H264 intro modes because. All right. Can you please add 3D transforms to that question? All right, so I was asked just uh, for the recording's purposes that uh, uh, is spatial prediction a dead end? Uh, DALA, uh, new experimental codec, seems to have good results with frequency prediction. And uh, what I would say is that we certainly haven't milked the limits of spatial prediction. Uh, some of the proposals from HEVC were way more complicated than what wound up in HEVC for spatial prediction. The big problem is that right now, uh, spatial prediction is sort of uh, decided either uh, what prediction mode you want to use, it's decided kind of by angular binary search or by trying to uh, correlate against some sort of reference function, which kind of makes it expensive to choose your mode. Um, as far as uh, frequency prediction, DALA, they seem to like what they have. Their results are uh, good, sort of, are great, sort of, from the perspective of a greenfield effort, but they don't seem to be where uh, sort of the current state of the art is in. Uh, published DCT codecs. They're not as good as HEVC or VP9 for intraframes, at least in my biased opinion. Um, a bunch of people have tried to plug frequency prediction into a DCT codec and it hasn't worked that well for them. Uh, you know, d frequency prediction isn't exclusive uh, versus DCT codecs, but the DCT codec people haven't made it work out better than uh, their spatial prediction. So either uh, frequency prediction will uh, DCT reach the, either DCTs kind of break frequency prediction in a weird way, or it's good, but it's not necessarily better. It's, it's still kind of early in the days of DALA and other people's frequency prediction efforts with more conventional approaches haven't worked out. Yeah, I think their latest update, which was only about a week or two old out of DALA was basically around their inch prediction. They were saying that they were trying to match even JPEG at this point. And that the um, you know, P frames and B frames are so small that they feel like the big games are in the I frames. And that um, they were basically holding up JPEG as the de facto goal to hit. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> yeah. One of the quests where one of the audience members just volunteered that uh, DALA is kind of using JPEG as their goal right now, and they say they're kind of on par with that, and that leaves a lot of room to, state of the, to where state of the art is now. Is it fair to 
to say that DCG codecs have had an order of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude more work than Wavelet codecs? Definitely. Uh, what do you think would happen if Wavelet codecs had the same amount of work as DCG codecs? So uh, I was asked if DCT codecs have seen way more work than wavelet codecs. That's definitely true. And once it seemed uh, obvious that H.264 was going to be a wild success, people definitely invested less in wavelet codecs and instead invested in making sure they have the best H.264 implementation. And uh, ultimately, uh, if people had invested more in wavelet codecs, is kind of a counterfactual that's really hard to predict. And I just don't have the context to say, would they be better than DCT codecs? They certainly would be better than where wavelet codecs are now. I kind of outlined some of the unsolved problems in wavelet codecs. And really, it comes down to someone being motivated uh, to actually doing the work and solving those problems or proving that the problems aren't solvable. I just saw this article today at BBC. The Nova streaming technology that uh, reduces 4K, 4K compression, reduces it by 50%. Do you know anything about how they're implementing that? Is it hardware or algorithm? What's going on? I don't know anything about that particular. It it's on the BBC today. You see it? V Nova? V Nova. I've never heard of them. How they're able to reduce the bandwidth by 50%. On 4K. It's I know. Is it for real? I don't know if the, that VNOVA thing is for real. I know there's always small companies saying that they have something that's an order of magnitude better than what everybody else is doing, and usually it's like 10% better in one particular, on one set of problem clips. And the other thing is, it turns out that doing a codec comparison is really hard, and it's really easy to kind of break a codec even metrics-wise in a way that doesn't make it look bad. But you've basically shifted all of your uh, color information like half a pixel over, which completely screws up all the errors and things like that. And that's why I didn't do a codec shootout here or anything like that. You really sort of need people who are experts in each of those codecs uh, tuning your settings and looking at and making sure that uh, if you're trying to measure PSNR, then that's what the codec is optimizing for and things like that. All right, I think that's it. OK, one last question. So, I mean, I've heard a few things about somehow using vector graphics for something like iframes, or I don't even know, for video coding, and also 3D transforms. Do you, do you have any sense of whether these are interesting techniques or not? So I, I haven't seen anything that looks quite like vector graphics in that. I've seen two things that are sort of similar, uh, conceptually at least. One is a concept called trixels, where you have a bunch of uh, vertices and you uh, tile your image into uh, triangles. And then for your motion, you're moving the vertices around and warping the triangles, which kind of seems cool on paper, but implementation-wise is kind of a mess. And uh, as far as 3D transforms go, the big problem is that in uh, fast motion, your displacement between frames is a much larger scale than sort of the localized variations. Yes. Yes? Excellent. Cool. Uh, so, obviously, thanks, Alex. That was awesome. Um, I think we actually have a few lightning talks. Uh, Nick, want to do one? Uh, Steve, I think. Are you grabbing your laptop? Okay. So, no? Oh, restroom. Back right. Uh, it's okay. We'll turn off the camera. So just so everybody knows. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll turn off the camera and have a fireside chat with one of the people here. Steve, you ready? Yeah. I need your laptop.
You go first, because I'm going to turn off the camera when he goes. Okay. So I don't get a lapel mic? You do. Oh, I do. You can just hold it if you want. It's feeling kind of fancy. Is this even recording now? Like, yeah, it's still recording. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for anybody that doesn't know, uh, this is Steve. Um, we work together on VideoJS. See if this here. works. Um, <laughs> hey again, let me figure this part out. There's also, uh, I think, there's four slices of Mr. Pistato Head left. Oh, Did gosh. Because the name alone. <laughs> okay. Bear with me just a second. I put this together kind of last minute. So, um, in the last couple of meetups, uh, Matt did a quick lightning talk uh, around the stuff that we're doing for VideoJS 5.0, kind of the next uh, big version of our open source browser based video player. And um, so, as part of that major version, we've got a number of different features going in, and I wanted to do just a quick lightning talk showing one of those things off. Um, <coughs> So this is around the dimensions of the video player itself, right? So uh, with VideoJS uh, today and for the history of the project, you would give it a width and height, and it would just statically size itself to that width and height in pixels. Oh, hang on, let me turn off flux. There we go. Um, and that's worked fine. So you give it a width and height, and it ends up exactly the size that you want it to be. Um, but now you have um, a lot of sites being built in um, these responsive frameworks like Bootstrap, right? And in a responsive framework, it automatically sizes um, the content to match the uh, width of the display. So if you're on mobile devices, like if I start to resize the browser, you can see that like it starts to stack things instead of having them horizontally. Um, and so with your video player, you want something that works in this type of fluid layout. Um, and so we've got a lot of requests around that for VideoJS. And so with VideoJS uh, today, um, you can still set it to 100% width. You can use CSS to make it um, go to 100% width of its containing element, um, and that will make it fluid, right? So I can resize the browser, and it will stay the width of whatever you want it to be, right? Um, but that's, that's not what you want. What you want is this hotness right here. Ooh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, you, want, you want the aspect ratio to stay the same. You don't want it to have the, the growing columns or letterboxing. Right? Um, and so what that comes down to is um, what a list apart calls creating intrinsic ratios for video, which is an overly fancy term for this. Um, what it comes down to is essentially this, this method of um, you essentially set the element to 100% width, you set the height to zero, and you set either the padding top or bottom to uh, the ratio of your aspect ratio, right? So in a percentage form. The reason this works is because the padding and margin of your elements are based on the width of the element. So we can't use height here because height, if I did like 50% height, it would be 50% of the height of the element that it's inside of, right? And we want 50% of the width. And so that's why, in this case, we're able to use padding to cr kind of create that ratio without using JavaScript. Uh, we can just use CSS for this, and it creates it and keeps it in that as you size the video player. So that's a pretty cool technique there. Um, so then in addition to this, um, I don't know if you've um, found this with the video element, um, but it's got some pretty cool features as far as automatically sizing itself. So um, I've got some examples here. This is just the bare video element itself. The top one is uh, just a video element. Uh, it's got a source, but preload none, so we know nothing about the video yet. And with no dimension attributes, uh, it just starts at 300 by 150 pixels, right? So if it has no sizing information, so it just automatically sizes to 300 by 150. Um, but then as soon as um, I play the video and it gets the metadata of the video, it can know the size um, that is in the video data. And it will automatically resize to the size of the video. So that's pretty cool. Um, 
And if you, for instance, only provide a width and no height, um, first of all, like this will, um, by default, make it like so. Here I've set a width of 400. It will make it 400 width, um, and then it will keep that same aspect ratio of the 300 by 150. But now you'll have 400, uh, 400 width and 200 height by default. And then when I play the video, it'll stay 400 width but then adjust the height, you see it kind of pop up there, to match the aspect ratio of the video. And then finally you can do the same with height. So here I have a height of 200, and if I hit play, you'll see it kind of extend to the right to match the aspect ratio of the video. So it's pretty cool built-in features of the video element. Um, unfortunately with, yes, Nick. Yeah, actually, so if I pull this up in Chrome or Firefox, it'll do the same thing. But, but uh, you know, what happens to any content that you have on the right-hand side? So this, this tends to be more of a specific use case of um, dropping it into a page and you just want it to work, right? So if you're actually building content around this, you don't want this like shoving content off the side. But if you provide anything else on top of this, if any other CSS dimensions, or if you put a containing element around it that has hard dimensions, it won't break out of that. It'll just kind of flow into space. So you don't have to worry about like breaking your layout in this sense. Um, so yeah, with VideoJS, unfortunately, we can't take advantage of this feature because the way VideoJS works is uh, we grab the video element and wrap it in a div, uh, which allows us to then overlay the controls and other features like ads and everything else that you want in video player. And so in that case, the div is the one that actually provides the width and the height. And the video element or the flash object or anything else that we're using as kind of like the video display gets sized to 100% of the player. Um, so we kind of needed to recreate this in VideoJS um, along with kind of the um, fluid responsive layout stuff. And so um, that was my project a couple weeks ago. And I set up a bunch of test cases. So, so here's VideoJS with the no dimensions. And you can see we get kind of like that 350 by 150, 300 by 150 sizing. Um, here's an example of it with after we get the metadata. So here I've actually preload metadata set on the video. So we know the inherent dimensions, and it automatically resizes itself. Um, <laughs> still works with the same. Like if you provide a width and a height, it will automatically fix itself to that width and height. Um, same things with the, if you provide a width but no height, uh, it will adjust itself to the right aspect ratio compared to you, the width that you provide. And then when you get the metadata, it will adjust itself just like the video element did. Um, same with height. And if I click one of these, like for example the height one, you'll see it do the exact same thing. So it kind of adjusts itself to, ma to match the aspect ratio. Uh, we provided a, like a VJS fill class, so I don't know if you can see this well enough, but like if you provide, if you add like a class of VJS fill, it'll just fill whatever container it's in. Uh, and then these are different like options for how you kind of create these fluid layouts. So you can use JavaScript or you can use a CSS class. Um, so if you add the VJS 16.9 class, it will automatically size the player to 16 by 9. If you add a specific, you can add a specific aspect ratio to the player through one of the options. So here I have an aspect ratio of four to one, which is extreme, but it will force it to that aspect ratio and then automatically adjust as you're resizing the page in a fluid layout. Um, same with just kind of like the fluid true option. So just a bunch of different ways to kind of provide the same uh, use cases. And then it's all kind of automatic. It, um, will do something by default, and then as soon as it has more information from the video metadata, it will adjust itself as long as you haven't uh, given it any other uh, strict dimensions. So another piece of this is um, with the video element, with all of its magic resizing and stuff, if you provide anything on top of it, like a CSS styling or um, um, inline styles on the, on the element, it will override anything that the video element is trying to do automatically. And we wanted the same experience with VideoJS, so uh, that kept us from being able to use inline styles. And uh, you know, the simplest way to do this would have been um, element.style.width equals something, right? But the problem with that is that um, you can't override that with CSS, and we wanted that to be possible for 
people who are designing skins and, and sizing the player themselves to be able to override all of this automatic stuff that we have here. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's all going into VideoJS 5.0. We'll hopefully be releasing that in the next couple of months. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.